Okay, great. Uh, let's get started. We have a packed and very exciting lineup of presentations today, so I'm going to take some time for all of them. I'm going to start off, though, by first uh, thanking our participants. Seriously, uh, we had some last-minute updates where we got some prize money, and that added some, uh, like, a formal structure, and suddenly folks had to give one PowerPoint slide and present on that slide for three minutes. We added those formalities to kind of mirror the three-minute thesis competition. Um, so if you're interested in presenting that, this is kind of like a warm-up. We also needed to save time because we had so many, so much interest. We have nine presentations today, and so each of three minutes with like three minutes for Q&A afterwards, that like puts us kind of at the limits of this, uh, of our uh, window here. So again, thank you presenters for pivoting, for adapting, for putting the time and effort in to meet those requirements in like a one week turnaround. Um, I really appreciate it. You're helping to set, set the precedent for how this event will, will kind of move forward. Uh, in the semesters to come. Of course, I'm going to thank the team as well here at the WLDH studio. I think everyone knows me. I didn't introduce myself. I'm Curtis. I'm the director of the studio. I think everyone here knows me. All right, we're good. Um, but I want to thank the team who have been great and just um, making this event possible, especially Assistant Director Cheyenne Roy and our communications uh, director, um, Larissa Roca. Speaking of which, Larissa has been, uh, in case you haven't noticed, loading our social media landscape with all sorts of awesome work. Uh, Larissa, like, look at this post. It's a, we have just an unending stream of wonderful That's a golf ball. Ball. Yeah. 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 In case you haven't noticed, there is a rhythm to all this. You kind of see it in, in the, uh, in the uh, color scheme here. But it is Mondays meet the TAs. And so we have our TAs, our FLTAs, our GAs, our spotlight in there. Tuesdays is in case you missed it, so we'll recap something from the week before. Wednesdays is meet the alumni. Um, Thursday, do we have a meet the alumni somewhere in here? Oh, yeah. There we are. There we have meet the alumni on Wednesdays. There we need your help. So we have tons of alumni doing great things, so please reach out to us and put us in touch with them, and we will spotlight them and let everyone know the great stuff that they've gone on to do after graduating. Thursdays is Classroom Spotlight, um, and that's what this looks like over here. You can just give us a blur. This is, uh, I think this is your class, Dora, right? This is Dora's Latin class coming in and doing a, a session in VR. Classroom Spotlight, you just give us a blur about something that you're doing in your classroom. It does not have to be related to tech, just something you want to share it with everyone. Um, and we'll post that blur and hopefully a photo of that, of, of, of your classroom and uh, you know, platform the cool stuff that you're doing in class. Faculty, TAs, if you're teaching, uh, then you can have a spotlight. And then on Fridays, meet the faculty, right? So I appreciate faculty, TAs, everyone engaging with this. We have tons of feedback, tons of input. Um, this is great for building your own professional portfolios, right? You can screenshot this stuff put it on your professional website, put it into your portfolio, whatever form that may take. It's also really good for the health of the department, right? It's a big part of the survival, like the survivability, the resilience, the strength of a language department is its ability, right, to tell its story. And one way to do that is through social media. And now with this five-day schedule, thanks to Larissa, we have kind of a diverse means to continually tell that. Story. So please engage with that. You can engage with our social media offerings by going to the World Languages and Digital Humanities Studio uh, webpage and you find all the forms to engage with everything that I just mentioned there. We also send updates every week with all those links too. So you will be reminded again and again how to get engaged uh, with all this stuff. I really appreciate Chris's work there and all, all your uh, engagement setting up events like this one today. This is our uh, second meetup of the semester. The first one was the showcase, and I want to thank again Maria Comsa and Andy Jose and Dora Benarucci and Kathleen Condre, who presented at, at that first meeting. That first meeting was finished projects, a project's pretty close to completion. Uh, that set up today's event, which is looking forward, right? And we're looking at pitches today, and um, we're not just giving prizes to the top three, but we're also like sharing that information like where DH is going in this department with everyone in this room, everyone who watches the video, we're recording the event. 
It's great for the team here to know what sort of DH interest there is in this department. This is a fun way to do that. So it's not just about this top three prizes, it's about sharing that information, and building momentum around uh, DH. Uh, that's what we're doing today. Again, we're also taking plenty of pictures. We're gonna, we already had one news wire run today. We're gonna do another one next week. So for all of you who are participating today, your presentations, even if you don't win the top prize, they will be platformed and publicized. Uh, throughout our department and across campus. Okay, I think I've said everything I need to say. I think we're ready to start. We have nine really exciting uh, presentations. Mike uh, Hall is going to be uh, queuing folks when to come up and prepping their slides. I'm gonna be in the back, I'm working with the judges. We have three judges, myself, Dave Frederick, and Larissa Broken. Thank you both for volunteering to be our judges. Let's give them a round of applause. You might have seen in uh, the messaging around the event, what we're looking at is innovation and collaboration. Right, all our participants know as well. Innovation and collaboration, we're looking for feasibility, like what work have you done already to kind of map out whether this is feasible or not? And then it's applicability, the presentation's applicability to world languages and world culture. So that's what the judges are kind of working with. Uh, we'll share the results uh, later today, and then I will send direct feedback to each presenter. So alongside all the, public, the publicity and sharing your ideas, getting this platform, you're also going to get some detailed feedback from me, Dave, and Larissa. OK, Mike, you ready to go? Yep. All right. All right. Our first presentation will be by Dr. Maria Concha for Visualizing Four Centuries of French Theater. to really visualize how theater evolved over four centuries. So the, the main question is, of course, can we visualize this? And what would be the simplest tool to visualize it in that students can use and they don't need special skills for? So I thought we could create a corpus of plays. I have a lot of plays already that are digitized. There are a lot of other ones that are available through Google or through Gallica that students could use prepare, clean, collaborate to learn how to prepare a play for visualizing, and then we would use Voyant tools to actually look at the plays. One of the first things that may be very obvious to me, because I've done digital humanities, is that key words will be things like conjunctions and uh, words that are very common. Well, students may not know that. It will be an interesting discovery. They will learn how to create stop word lists how to prepare the text, what themes to look for, and how to actually get to the themes and to the language in this corpus of plays. As they build on this, uh, they will showcase their results through multimedia presentations and combine the information that they gather through Voyant with the knowledge that they learn in class. It is something that we learn through close reading different than what they learned through distant reading? Do the two overlap? And the multimedia presentations, I'm hoping to create maybe a web page where students would have their work uh, showcased, uh, would include, of course, information that they learn in class, such as author information, themes, rules for the theatrical genres, and then eventually get to that specificity. The goal, of course, is to increase cultural competency. Uh, students would learn about the themes, they would deduct this themselves and really have a hands-on approach rather than have to read a text that is in older French and difficult to understand. They would have to collaborate and really work with those texts together in the tar target language, of course. And then in the process, I think they will greatly enhance their oral proficiency in French because as you fight with that text to look at the verb endings in the 17th century and how they change to the 20th century, you learn a lot about the themes, about the language, about theater in general. So they will gather how we went from this 17th century to something very modern, like La Cambapis show in the 20th century. So that, that's my project. I hope you like it. Merci. <laughs> And actually, we have 
about three minutes for Q&A. So, so we'll run Q&A after each presentation. You want to stay up here, Maria? And then, sure. Oh, you're, right, you're on the right one. All right, so three minutes. Uh, questions for Maria? Yes. Uh, is, does Wyant has extra tools that are paid? Like if you win, how would you use like the money towards that? Um, that's a really good question. I haven't thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't think Voyant is a paid tool, okay. it's available freely, so you can enter text, but for using 20th century texts, we may need to pay to get the actual text, because of course 17th and 18th century plays are readily available online, but more recent texts will not have any of that available, so um, it would be a question of obtaining copyright maybe to use the texts mm -hmm. that somebody has digitized but gotcha. that they don't share. Okay, thank you. They will be more difficult for students to work with because some of the digitized texts have special characters like long S's instead of a regular S and all sorts of artifacts that they have not seen before. So it'll be really fun to discover that in the process and also learn how to manipulate it and how to transform that text so it's actually usable by something like Wyoming. Would you have to apply some more tools to the older place? Um, it'll be just editing, uh, but it'll take more time. So time is a resource for that, yes. yes. Uh, how do you talk about the time you spend like cleaning the test? Like most of the time that I use it, it's like getting the pages up in and or like notes on the side. Mm -hmm. One of the possible uh, things that I'd like to do is to have students annotate at least one scene out of the play, like doing a critical edition, to really have them confront themselves with the work that goes into that. Uh, but I have already prepared, I have been doing this type of work for quite a while, and I have a lot of uh, play uh, texts ready to go. So students will work on some of it, but I do have a corpus that is ready to go, which I would bring in. So they wouldn't have to do all that work because they also have to read the plays, they have to do some research on the authors and the period, the historical context. So I have thought about bringing things that will be ready for the students. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right, our second presentation will be Basic Spanish Program Current Strategy, Expanding F2F Communication with Padlet. Hello everybody, my name is Brenda, and well, we're not bringing something totally new for you guys, it's related to Padlet, but the main idea of what we're trying to do in our four classes, our four uh, levels, is to expand, extend uh, this communication that they start in class, face to face, so, by showing this number five is, so all our four uh, levels during the semester, they have five classes where the entire time, pretty much, is dedicated for students to be in small groups and have simultaneous presentations, short like conversation clubs, where the instructor is only pretty much walking around, making sure everybody's doing their best they can in the target language, and in a way, it's sort of like a comfortable area for the students to be having these moments where when they are speaking in small groups, they have all these noises that in a way are protecting them from being just heard by the instructor or the entire class. So all that sort of engagement that they start um, in class, we want them to continue via Padlet by writing, 
small reflections of what they already share in class, being created maybe by sharing a photo or coming up with a different title. Uh, and also then have each student give a short comment to their classmates. So it's in a way, you know, it's a combination, right? Face to face and then writing them on a different space. But so we wanted to just to share what we're doing at the moment. The final goal would be, if possible, to have at the very end of the semester one part lab where all, for example, each level is going to have all students sending a short reflection on how these type of activities have sort of helped them to, you know, spontaneously or not, use the target language. So if we get funds, at least, uh, <laughs> we would like this Padlet Chinermos account where, yes, we could have multiple students just share at the end of the semester comments. And, you know, English will, will be welcome, but it's pretty much to continue this communication that they started already in the class. So I think that's it. In terms of the money, uh, is that going to be used to buy seats of Padlet, or do we already have enough seats, or how does that work? Well, honestly, I think uh, there is a Padlet, uh, I don't know if it's called Plan Plantium Premium, but all we would need is an account that allows to have four Padlets, mm -hmm. in which multiple students can at least give one entry. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's, it's, it's actually just you know one of the, not basic, but it's not the top top Padlet. I know that it's a Padlet, I think that it's $1,000 a year, but that's not necessary. It will okay. be a Padlet that allows at least, let's say, one or three, maybe 400 entries. So I, I'm not quite sure, but I don't think it, it, I think it was sort of like 400, no, uh, I think I put it in the proposal, but there is something around maybe two to 300 that would allow this amount of okay. that. Very much. Our next presentation will be Hunger Hero, a community service slash food exchange app by China Nellon, Curious Bruce, and Carter Buckley. Right, so what we have noticed as graduate students is not not only are undergraduate students affected by um, food disparities, so are graduate students, 
but definitely international students, right? Because they have access to less funds, access to being able to go get um, funds, things of that nature. So we were looking at how could we exchange community service, right, for food, right? Um, so the idea with the app would be that you would be able to get X amount of community service hours at these places, and then you'll be able to exchange those hours for additional food, right? So we know that you already get X amount of free food, but if maybe you need more vegetables this day, right? So I worked this amount of hours, now I'll be able to exchange. Um, now I will have Carrie to talk a little bit more about what type of community service we would actually be doing. Awesome. So uh, as China's mentioned, uh, one of the biggest things is food security. You know, that's like an issue that so many people are struggling with. But you know, sometimes to try and balance that out, it's not just an issue of where can I go and get food, it's also how can I stretch my dollar a little bit more. You know, and that's uh, something that you know all ethnicities, all uh, cultures deal with, especially here. And this is crazy that we're in Atlanta milk and honey. So we're still trying to figure out how can we find that balance. You know, so we are looking at ways to find not-for-profit organizations or entities that offer um, uh, service hours and we'll be able to exchange that. So this all came from the idea that uh, the government says that it's about $31.60 per hour for uh, volunteer hours that they can use as in-kind, so we're matching that. We're looking at that resource to be able to balance this out. So we're finding people that we can use, uh, that will partner and allow us to use custom uh, our community service. Oh, well, sweet. Okay, so really quickly, we've already put together a sort of flowchart about for how that app works. We use Adobe XD to sort of lay out what that would look like and how we use it. And then we started meeting with uh, Food Pantry, maybe, and then also uh, Terry's has an idea, or a sort of an existing sort of free to partner that we come up with. That's all for, for us. Do you need money to get the app off the ground or to get food? We need the money for the app off the ground. The okay. Beta testing and development. Okay. And since you're an agricultural, <coughs> no, environmental agriculture, sorry, um, do you have any idea of where the food would come from or is there like. That's an awesome question. So uh, this is all bred from a, a project I'm working with, Sustainable Ag. Uh, looking at container farms, looking at hydroponics, aquaponics, the abundance of food, how do we find a way to uh, align that with the interests of people who are either unhoused or need food security um, to, be, to be maintained or met. So that's how we're getting that from the growers. And we're going to find ways to have a collection of growers and uh, food distributors and be able to work with them. So that's how we're going to work. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Time. We got like two minutes. Really? Um, I just wondered about the the service hours, and can you explain that mechanic just a little more detail there? Okay, so um, actually, uh, when we heard this was a pitch, that is actually one of the things that we are kind of concerned about that we want to work on. But what we have come down to with service hours is that we definitely understand that X amount of service hours equals the product, right? So we de understand that, for instance, at the local food pantry that we have here, if they were working with us, maybe that's a different exchange rate than if we were um, had a relationship with HARPS, right? Um, where they were able to, but we are trying to come up with a basic one so that, for instance, HARPS wouldn't charge 10 community salaries for a, for a head of cabbage where this one would charge, you know what I'm saying, one community. So we're still, we do definitely need help with that, trying to figure out that aspect of it, and um, that's part of the mechanics that we're still working on. Yes. And I think the next layer of it is we're seeing this almost as a couponing, you know, and such. So, and we're working with different uh, producers or like a General Mills or they offer different products that come out. They'll be able to say, well, hey, you can offer this as a coupon approach to where they can put X amount of hours in and these are also available. Some people may need formula or may need diapers, so we'll be able to work with those producers to be able to offer incentives. How does this work together with language learning? Great question, right? So our main focus with language learning and international students in, in particular is because this demographic, including mm -hmm. myself, we suffer a lot from food disparity. And this would be a great opportunity for us to be able to go out and get community service hours to add additionally to the things that we need. So that is how it directly touches us in this department. And yes. it will also allow for us to look at those communities or those populations.
populations, you know, Marshallese, you're talking about Spanish speakers that are in the Northwest Arkansas community, we'll be able to find uh, people who offer um, uh, service hours with those those uh, those communities, you know, so that's how we'll be able to do it. So they can be able to find, you know, communities that serve them. Our fourth presentation will be how to utilize AI and role play activities with Dr. Magnetti, Angela, Guillermo, Isi, and Liz. Oh, very, very fun. Right. So, I will, this is something, don't just pay attention to this part. This is part of the presentation. Yeah, so I just wanted to share, this is a project that I'm doing currently in my conversation class, where there is a, a website, it's honeymaker.com, that allows to create all these cool videos with avatars that you create. But, so the objective of this sort of project that I started this semester with my class is to encourage the students to, uh, well, to give a, a digital life to the work that they store in the classroom. So some of the activities are obviously creating a, a story, creating characters, creating dialogues that they can represent in class to practice. They write the script in class, they continue home working together, and then they bring back to class to continue the story. And so I found this cool uh, tool that is again animaker.com that allows them you just create the type of avatars that you want, you can personalize it however you want and give this artificial voice that you decide for the avatar to have. So the goal is to have all these small projects in the class that at the end are going to be pretty much videos that we can share with other language students to show how certain tools can be fun while you're learning a second language but also this tool is so cool that you don't really need to speak a second language mm -hmm. to just you know write a script and put it in the language that you want and have this awesome you know artificial voice that gives life to the uh, avatar. So sorry, this is not really the very last one, and it's my mistake. Sorry, but at the end, it's just a project that is being done now in class. You can oh, how do we do that? Go to the left. Tap on the left. Okay, sorry. Yes, I was going to just show you how these little uh, characters uh, speak and interact. Uh, but it's, it's just a current project in the class. And if you know that is, if there are some funds for it, Animaker.com has this awesome type of different account that gives you way more features, uh, allows you as a coordinator to get in different projects and give feedback, and maybe download these videos because. Right now, with a free account, you just can download maybe like three seconds videos. So I'm cheating. I'm making the videos, but then I'm recording them with another software. And that's how I share them with the students. Don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's just a current project. And I guess I should want them to just hear how cool they do these things. Any questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. Could you tell us about the experience you've had so far, like how, how students have responded to, to working with us? Okay, so when I told them about we're going to create our own avatars, they thought I was crazy, they didn't really understand how we were going to do this. It was just the very first day that I dedicated, you know, 50 minutes in class to say, let's go to animaker.com and see what you can do. You really, you know, you can just sign up with any um, email account and by the time I was just giving them the second instruction on how they can maybe put this here, put there, they, are, they were already having their avatars talking and having different voices. So it was awesome uh, and it's still awesome. They're learning obviously faster than me, which is normal. Um, and they already started sending me their productions when they were not, you know, they didn't have to do it, but obviously they continue to work at home and so Friday, for example, we're going to give again some time to keep working on, on their stories. 
uh, one of the projects in the class is that all students will become candidates for a presidency uh, of the campus, and they have to come up with their real video, give it their proposal, but then have their avatar version with a different voice, you know. Okay. Uh, we'll see. Hopefully it's going to be fun and they're excited about it. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, our next presentation will be Spanish Transmedia Strategy with Angela, Guillermo, Liz, and Isi. Sometimes TAs, we do not appear on social media. We do not appear on the website. Now with this project, what we want to visit and visualize is that what we're doing, our faces, and also it's a good way that when we are gonna apply for a job, people can know who we are, what we have been doing. And also as uh, Curtis mentioned, social media is a good way to showing what we are doing and showing that World Language Department compared to literature, we are trying to do a great impact in the community, so that's what the profile is about. In the case of short videos, it's about this. Okay, so short videos is more focused on the students, undergraduate students, so we are going to do videos of 30 or 60 seconds, that's why we also call it reels, and basically they will answer the question, so why they selected Spanish as their target language, then the second will be how has been the process of learning this language, and what are the advantages professional and social when they get proficiency in this language. And last we have the podcast project that is Spanish in Club, so of course, es hora del español. We are trying to promote the work of the TAs and the staff in the Spanish section, but also we're trying to put the highlight, the spotlight on the TAs and how is this experience to come to a new country and teaching our language and for some of us being a teacher for the first time. So we're all trying. We're also trying to involve in the future some other languages, some other TAs, and see how can we build bridges between all the sections. Because right now, in this scenario, when our departments are under threat, I think we need to work together to highlight the importance of teaching and learning languages. My usual question, uh, what would you use the money for? Would it, would it be for something specific, like a website to manage it, or? Okay, there are a lot of resources that we may need mm -hmm. to use first. These are my same boot for the podcast, of course, and all the tools that we have granted for uh, using social media. However, sometimes when you want to record videos or do interviews, you need on-the-go equipment and maybe we will invest some of that money on tools like this. In the case of social media, you know that Canva offered the opportunity to help you to design something that is gonna be appealing for, for the audience. So we can use Canva to test what kind of pictures fits with the templates that they have, but we can also adapt our own style. Mm -hmm. And if you have a question, you can 
in the social media, for example, to post like on Instagram, on Facebook, and all that for the same time, just instead of just like making free posts. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, so I think the wheels get posted. Uh, basically on Instagram, in our account on Instagram. Well, in the future, we could develop a, Follow us. a, a web page <laughs> or something for the Spanish section posted by the university web page. But, you know, baby steps. We are starting. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, we're good. Right. Right. is visualizing voices of Ukraine with Omeka but with Dr. Karkovich. And you're stepping in for her. Right? Yes, I've been sent to represent Dr. Karkovich. Yes. So. Okay, great. And we just got to hold on for a full yeah. slide. <laughs> oh, I was thinking I Oh, here you go? Okay, great. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, is there a way oh, to swipe this one? Yes, I'm not Dr. Bukovic, but I'm representing her. So if you don't know Dr. Bukovic, she's the assistant professor for the Russian department. So I'm not the <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, Is my friend right? Okay. Yes. So our project is called Visualizing Voices of Ukraine. And in order to do this, we are using a plugin and a site with Omega. And we already have the site set up. So you might be thinking, why a website? Because the internet's not exactly new, it's 2023. But the, what we believe is that this utilization of the internet is very unique because we're using the internet to kind of more resemble, to make our learning and our instruction resemble like actual human knowledge where, you know, what people learned before can be built upon by the people that come after. And so that's what we're kind of doing. We are going to also use it for our particular uh, class to compare and contrast maps and compare and contrast text both in Russian and in English, right? So here's an example where like, we have the modern day maps and we have the maps of the 1700s where most of our stories take place. And so, uh, yeah, so what we want to do is we want to compare primary sources in their original language and in their like, uh, in the translated language just to show like the different nuances and how the language has changed and evolved over time. And also, well, this is how we uh, make it resemble actual human knowledge evolution. Because we have one class that takes the, the primary text and they start analyzing it and they make their different analysis and they publish it in the site. And then classes that come afterwards can not only use the primary sources, but also build upon the works of students of the past, just like human knowledge. And the benefit of this is we just make the site once and then we just update it. So there's no real like issue of creating it over and over again for different classes. Uh, yes, and so this will help our language goals of teaching languages because language is so intricately involved with history. And so by taking these texts in the language and comparing it to the historical context of the time and the historical context of the present, we can show this natural evolution and how the past and the present are interrelated and interconnected, both in terms of geopolitics, in terms of culture, in terms of society, in terms of language, in terms of pretty much everything. instead of RCGIS story maps. Yes. I'm kind of curious. Yes. I say Omeka because that's what Dr. Prokovich told me to present on. <laughs> <laughs> that's not entirely my choice. But I believe it's because uh, she already got access to Omeka through the University of Arkansas. They provided us a website through Omeka. But that I, I truthfully don't know. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I can probably anticipate a judge's question about the funding. <laughs> so uh, with the funding, uh, there's two, two things we can do with it. One, it's to uh, hire people to help train us, because this is our first time using it, and of course, we're not professionals at it yet. So we want to hire and compensate people to teach us how to use it, and all, how to install the plugins, and how to utilize the plugins. Next, we could also use the funds to buy the different texts and buy access to the different texts because there's going to be a variety of different texts from like uh, the 1800s in the golden age of Russian literature to a hopefully more modern day texts with like Ukrainian, Belarusian, and Russian writers. 
So those are that's how we're going to use tools. Was that your question? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us about the experience that you've had in this course yes. so far? Um, I have had two experiences, one with the language and with like the literature. Which one are you asking? Both. Okay. Both. Both. Yes. Um, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy it. It's a very interesting challenge. It's a very different challenge. I'm not a language or a humanities major, so it's a different perspective on the world for me. Um, I really love the language. It's very beautiful. It's very complicated. And I like complicated. And uh, as for the literature aspect, I think it's quite interesting. Uh, we were covering a variety of different writers, and it's very interesting to see that there were, like, I know this is obvious, but there were people living in the Russian Empire, and they have their own individual experiences. And it's very interesting to see how they transmit those experiences. And so it's a very, I know it's obvious that you know people have lives, but to see and read that, that's a very unique perspective for me. So. What is your name and what department are you with? You need to introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, uh, my name is Nikhil Pai. I'm an undergrad, so uh, I'm a physics and math major, pure math major. So not linguistics, not like humanities or world history, but I very much enjoy this subject and that's why I'm working with Dr. Nikhil Richards. Uh, now I do understand what you have mentioned regarding your background, that it has nothing to do with linguistics or humanities or that matter. However, I do have kind of uh, out of curiosity uh, how do you believe that when you juxtapose different uh, literary texts that have been translated into different languages, specifically Russian literature, since you, this is your focal point at least thus far, are you going to compare the translated texts from across different languages that come uh, from a wide array of uh, language families? For instance, if you look at Russian literature, once it has been translated to English, it's going to be differently translated than it is to Arabic. Are you going to translate to, for instance, uh, compare and contrast between how which one gets the idea across more mm -hmm. because maybe geographics have to deal something with that. Arabic is rather far uh, from yeah. uh, Russian in terms of landscape. So. First of all, I like the suit. It's pretty good. Um, it's, uh, it's um, most of the students in our class they speak only English, so it would be we would kind of be at a disadvantage in that regards because we can't really compare it to a language a language they don't know to another mm -hmm. language they don't know. So for our purposes, we're just going to translate it into English and have like different sources, kind of different translators give their own opinions on like, what this, oh yeah, this word has this context and mm -hmm. this nuance. So unfortunately, we're limited in that most of our students only speak English, so to add any other languages would kind of muddy the waters a little bit. Mm -hmm. But yes, uh, this in theory could be applied for that. If you have a different class with different language capabilities, then yes, that would be an even better use of this software. Thank you so much. Of course. And there was another question. All right, we can take we can take just one more. I want to ask me, does uh, the interface of Ameka seem uh, user friendly and easy to navigate to you? For the person using the public site, yes. <laughs> but for the people, the admins, it I do not understand it. But that's probably because this is my first time using it. I I, I will assume that with training, it'll become more easy for us to use, and uh, it's not. It's not entirely incomprehensible for us right now, so I hope it'll get better with more practice and time. All right, thank you very much. This next presentation is ChatGPT Expanding Tutoring Services, done by Guillermo. Hi, everyone. My name is Guillermo Pupo Fernet. I'm from Colombia, Barranquilla. Uh, I'm in the process of writing my dissertation. And I came up with ChatGPT for this presentation because I dislike that people do not understand ChatGPT. Recently, the University of New Mexico, in their website, in the library's website, if you start playing around with the lead guide, they said that ChatGPT is only used for writing essays. I have been talking to professors and asking, hey, what are you doing with ChatGPT? And they say, oh, I just realized that if I ask this question about my class, the students can have this answer. So I'm getting prepared just to change a little bit the question so they cannot use ChatGPT. And that's wrong. That's not the purpose of ChatGPT. In my case, I am using ChatGPT as my assistant. As a TA, I do not have money to pay an assistant. So I'm using <laughs> ChatGPT as my personal assistant. Then, how am I using it in my class? to train my students to use prompts for learning language. They do not have the time to come for the office hours. 
They barely come to my office hours. I have been using different kind of a schedule. They do not show up. It will be interesting to see how many people are coming to the Spanish Center, how many students we are helping in getting support with grammar. But with ChatGPT, they can use it anytime. They just go to Blackboard. I already designed different kind of prompts that they can follow this, and they, they have their own exercises, their own tutor, they get feedback, and if they do not understand how to craft the prompt, they can send me an email, and I will be right there just to modify the prompt. Now, Guillermo, the follow-up question is, oh, so this is just for Spanish. I'm sorry, you can use it in different language, for example, in the Préterit und auf Deutsch, or zum Beispiel, en la parfait en français. So there are different kind of options, but then the trick is, to learn how to do the prompt. And this is the skill that we do not have. We need to explore, and I have been following people on Twitter and LinkedIn to learn how to craft a better prompt. And this is why, Larissa, I need the $300. <laughs> why? Because with this money, I will create the space to invite students from different languages to train them how to make prompts that are useful for the class not for me, not for campus, it's for the class because my concern as someone who is teaching, as someone who is doing customer service is to offer a great service so people like him can enroll in foreign languages classes and they are not afraid that the language is hard. Let's make things easier with ChatGPT. Thank you. Questions? That's the difficult part uh, because the syllabus doesn't allow me to, to have a space for this. So that's why I have created the prompts by myself. They know that ChatGPT is there. And it's funny because uh, like two or three students that have come to my office hours, uh, I asked them, hey, have you used the prompt? No, I know what ChatGPT is, but I don't know. So then I have used my office hour to show them how to craft prompts, to follow this, change it a little bit, and then with that they said, oh, thank you, you and we'll start using it. So they can use it anytime. But then the only thing that they are missing, and if we're teaching language, we also need to teach them how to use AI language. That is another extension of the language. So I, I do not have the time. How do you teach them to write prompts? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. So because I do not have the time, so I only upload the prompts that I have designed. So if you have experience with coding, it's easy. You just start with basic instructions, and then you test, you realize what ChatGPT is giving you, then you modify the prompt, because most of the time without, please do not give me the answers, automatically it's going to give me a hint. Oh, Guillermo, remember that the present is like this, 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 or the ending, but I don't need that, because I want that they exposure themselves, making mistakes with ChatGPT, and at the end, they can say, just give me the answer, and boom, ChatGPT is going to give you the answer. Have you thought about um, having all your students send you transcripts of what they've done, so you can also then learn where ChatGPT drops the ball, because we know it, you know, quote unquote, hallucinates, and that can be, you know, problematic when, you know, someone's learning and they, maybe they're learning the wrong thing, but it's very confident and that, that, that happens to me, and what I told them is like, with grammar, that I'm only worried about the conjugation of the verb. Sometimes ChatGPT gave me like, weird verbs that doesn't exist. So, but what they, I am training then is conjugate the verb, the endings, memorize it. So even though that I say hablar, and I say, so just by knowing the R ending, present, imperfect, or future, they know exactly what the ending is. So for this purpose of conjugating, it's perfect. But then the other part is uh, complicated. Yeah. Is it only text that they enter in terms of the exercise, or can they also speak? Only text. Mm -hmm. That will be an additional AI tool that now are available. Uh, but so far, I'm only using text. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much. The final quick presentation is Easy Travel, Travel Guides in an Italian Language Conversation with Dr. Daniela D'Angelio, Yoser, and Eliana.
Nigeria for word languages. I am Yusuf. Uh, I'm the Arabic Account TA and I work at this language studio. I'm Alon and I'm from Russia and I'm from Pay here. So um, uh, we are here today to present a project that has been implemented in my class uh, at the Italian Conversation, Advanced Conversation this semester. We don't really have data because we don't we haven't practiced it yet. Um, however, my class is focused on regional aspects of Italy, and by the end of the semester, students will produce uh, two travel guides uh, focused on one region or a part of a region uh, related to their major, minor, or their interest. This project um, uh, aligns with actual five C's and three P's, um, and it's creative, flexible, and personalized. And, uh, and what we needed to, what we wanted to achieve is to combine cultural awareness, so visual aspects of Italy, with digital tools. And so we decided to implement Easy Travel, which is a free app which creates a, a, a website. And this website is the travel guide that the students will implement with, as you can see in the slide, multimodal. Um, Aspects so text, images, and because it's a conversational class, audio guides. So they can record their voice and they can describe a place, a city, part of a region that they visited or they didn't visit yet. So easy travel is is user friendly. It's easy to navigate and use. Uh, it offers different guided tours or for various destinations around the world. Um, it's also like easy. Uh, it's, you can either download it on your phone or uh, access directly to the internet. Uh, that way, like, to like discover uh, various destinations around the world. Uh, it also helps um, with improving your digital skills. So, uh, with content creation, so you can like create your own uh, audio or written or video guides. And um, it's like it, uh, it opens a space where you can like interact with others and receive feedback. Speaking about feedback, uh, your students can create their own audio guides, and their partners can uh, write a review on it. That would be awesome, I guess. And adding to the meat of our discussion, the project is doable. So if you are thinking about an alternative uh, to the PowerPoint presentation with your uh, with your students, please, we're here to support you so you can come up and we're going to have a hands-on experience with your students to explain how to use this travel. It's really user-friendly. Uh, also, uh, you can opt not for, uh, not for creating a, an audio guide, that your students uh, create audio guides. They can just uh, browse what Easy Travel already have and just use it to expand their knowledge. Thank you for attention. sections of conversation. Since it's a conversation, the first one and then second one, advanced conversation, there are three different professors who are going to teach on location this class. So if we get the money, <laughs> we can advance the levels of um, features that are easy travel um, um, uh, offers. And in my mind, we can have different tools in order to um, design a travel guide in the different classes. So students will have digital skills, different digital skills in at least two of these classes, if not more. Great. So there's the free version of it, yeah. and then there's the upgraded, like Padlet, Buffer. Right. Okay. Thank you. So are you going to run the, the review portion in your course? So yes. you're not, okay, so how is that going to work? Review what the... Uh, so someone creates, one of your students or a group of students create a, an audio guide yeah. and, and map and, and just do the whole easy travel uh, website. And then other students write reviews 
Okay, so the initial uh, the initial assi assi assignment before um, the user and I'm gonna will come to my class and present uh, easy travel is that they will explore something that is already prepared by someone else and they will write a review. Then Ayona and Yoser are gonna have a hands-on experience with my students, so my students will know how to use easy travel. They will have the first uh, travel guide and then as a peer review assessment, they are gonna look at each other's uh, travel guides and probably they're gonna write a review. Okay, so there are two the rounds of review. Yes. Yeah. First of one that yes. you just find on the site, and then one of the students. Okay, yes. awesome. And what's great about this, this is like open resource, so other people not from this university who are going to um, come across to this, their easy travel guide, they can uh, see, oh, there are 15 reviews of this guide. Probably it's a good guide. I'm going to use it mm -hmm. when I'm in Abruzzo or Toscana or whatever. And then I assume that you can also use this for other languages, and then maybe later on teach other instructors to apply that if they want. Yeah, that's a great point. So uh, there is all the language, so it can be in any language. And another good point about this travel that any guide can be uh, done in like several languages, like seven, six. So one guide may be done in English, Spanish, French, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Great. This is right. languages. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, for the final presentation of the day, we have Narco Fantasy Land. Presented by the Fantasy Land. No words, yes. This last one on. Okay. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Hello, everybody. This is me again. I'm Rebecca mm Cruz, -hmm. now flying solo. To <laughs> 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 introduce my dissertation project. But before we get into, the, into this, I want to ask you a question. What's the first thing that you think about? Or what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think about Colombia? And you don't need to answer, but thank you, Marisa, because I was pretty sure that you all were thinking about Shakira and her amazing coffee. Uh, however, maybe sadly, or at least problematically, the first thought that comes to mind is drug trafficking, violence, our problematic history with our big ally that is the United States on the war on drugs. So for that reason, my dissertation project took the shape of a podcast in English. Why? Because I think it is important to orient this uh, telling and retelling of our history to international audiences too to help us Colombians, but also foreign people to understand the ways in which we are telling the story, the ways in which we are, in which we are seeing the narco-traffic problem and phenomena surrounding that. Uh, for, that re for that reason, I have spaces as the center of my project. So normally, we have in this kind of research the figure of the capo, the drug dealer, as the center. But I'm trying to focus on the spaces, because spaces have changed. And spaces are sometimes places of memory, but some places they are not, and that's problematic. For instance, uh, I have this space that is Hacienda Napoles, that is the ranch that used to belong to Pablo Escobar. And this ranch is now reshaped as a family-oriented amusement park and a wildlife reservation. For that reason, my method uh, incorporates archive and ethnography at the same time. Last summer, I had the opportunity to, come, to go on a research trip and visit all of these spaces and get in contact, get in touch with not only visitors, which was an amazing experience, but also with local authorities, the architects, the people behind the reshaping of these spaces, and of course, people that is producing a narrative around this phenomena. And I think it is important to acknowledge the experiences of those who live and lost their life in those spaces. And one thing that I think is really uh, relevant is to look for the intersections between popular culture and these experiences of the space. Uh, our memory, our recollection of this phenomena is shaped also by the cultural products that we consume, the TV shows, the literature, that shapes our experience. So for that reason, I think it is important 
to question ourselves the way about the ways that we are consuming these cultural products, visiting these spaces, and also about the ethics behind these practices that could become dark tourism, narco tourism, or necro tourism. Uh, can you go in? <laughs> save, save for the Q and A. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> I suggest that somebody ask me what I need to add. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what were you going to add? Okay. Um, I think the importance of this project for our languages, literatures, and cultures in this particular moment is that. Teaching and learning languages is not only about grammar or conversation. It's about cultural awareness and it's about memory and identity. And my memories and your memories are not built in a vacuum. They are shaped by our shared cultural experience. And I think building this together in different languages, in transnational, interdisciplinary exercises, builds a bridge between the academic experience, the life experiences of people, and between the audiences. And in that way, we can achieve truth. We can achieve restorative justice for the victims. But we also can understand better the way in which we consume stories related to violence. So that's what I wanted to add. Thank you for that amazing question. Any other questions? <laughs> The money. Oh yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, regarding money, of course, I'm going to say again, the amazing equipment of the studio. I know I can call on that equipment now, but also there are well the additional softwares and everything. I can make an, an investment on that, and that also could be of use for some other uh, co-workers and stuff. Uh, but also. Um, I have some news about my project that I received yesterday. Uh, I enrolled in this uh, historical memory diploma at, at the University of Antioquia in Colombia. And well, I started with these classes, I pitched my project to them, and now I have a new alliance with the University of Berlin to start working with the memory studies group over there. And well, we're going to need funding to do the projects that we need. Uh, to, to, to plan. One of the projects that we were thinking about after my dissertation or a future moment is to start talking about uh, immersive experiences through artificial intelligence to places of memory. How could it be of certain for the building of historical memory to clarify some things, to open dialogues about this particular uh, places and situations. Any other questions? Yeah, well, you ha I would like to allude to something that you had mentioned earlier regarding the term memory. Now, which kind of memory are you, is the focal point here? Is it something that is uh, psychological, social, cultural, sociocultural? So which part of the memory truck is this, is this project going to address? Thank you for the amazing question, because is the memory understand as understood as historical memory. Mm -hmm. That involves different processes, yes. as we all know. So, of course, there's this thing that we have the presumption that we have a collective memory. Mm -hmm. That's questioned by many authors, like Hallbush and Picard, and some other theories on the, theory, on, on the, on the memory studies field. However, however, what I want to interrogate, what I want to question is the way that some narratives in these spaces, or official narratives or media narratives are trying to appear as a historical memory building exercise. Mm -hmm. To what extent is that, and I, I wouldn't say honest because I don't want to add moral judgment to this, but for the people that is involved in these processes, is this being of service? Is just a station of the pain? Are we, like, the, the price of these exercises for some people is paid in pain, in revictimization. So how can we be of service to understand that better and have a more ethical approach to historical memory building processes? Thanks so much. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh,
Um, thanks once again to all our presenters. Uh, thank you, Mike Hall, who found out seconds before this started that you'd be the moderator. And, uh, and So we want to stick around for a couple of minutes. We'll have pizza very soon. I want to thank our presenters uh, once again. We, uh, Dave, Larissa, and I uh, have a really tough job ahead of us. And, um, but we're really excited, I think, to talk about all these presentations some more. And um, follow up with all of you, the, the studio, to whatever extent possible, to whatever uh, extent is desired um, from our presenters. We are ready to, to collaborate with you and work with you. We're so excited about these projects. Uh, really excited about the future of DH uh, in the World Language Solutions and Cultures Department. Counterculture studies uh, program. So, very exciting stuff. Uh, thank you once again, presenters. Uh, we'll share the results later today, and then I'll have uh, you know extended feedback for, for each uh, presenter. Thanks again. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.